my task in this opening session is to describe you know, roughly 150 years of Fort Worth history in about 15 minutes. And we'll see how well we, we do that. But if, if we talk about District 9 and Ann's representation, as we look at the broad spectrum of history in this city, probably 80% of our historic resources in Fort Worth are found within the confines of District 9. So it's yeah, near and dear to my heart. I love living in it. And as Ann and we all felt about Joel, I think we all feel very well represented. So thank you for everything you, you do for us. You know, as we look at the grand sweep of, of Fort Worth history, there are a lot of cities that we look and look look to around the country that have an oil history or a cattle history or a railroad history or an aviation history. Fort Worth is one of those rare cities in the country that combines with all of these great legendary stories of the westering of the United States. We go back to our beginning of a modern city back to 1849, uh, 166 years ago uh, next week. June 6, 1849, Fort Worth was established as the northernmost outpost on a line of frontier forts along what was basically the western frontier of Texas. The only thing west of us were the Comanche and the Kiowa and other tribes who were fiercely continuing to guard this part of the frontier. They had successfully beat back the Spanish, the French, Confederate Texas, the United States. And it wasn't until the 1870s that the last kind of major push during the Red River Wars kind of accomplished the opening of the frontier. When this fort was established in 1849, this was still a very dangerous and precarious place to live. The fort itself sat just northwest of where the current courthouse is today. So as you go down to the courthouse, uh, you'll see a, a replica of the flagpole that would have stood at the fort at the time and a model of the 12-pound mountain howitzer that was the single field piece assigned to the fort during the period. The fort was only here from 1849 to 1853. In those four short years, the frontier pushed itself almost another 100 miles west. But very little actually happened here. You, know, you think of this uh, of a fort on the frontier and these great clashes with the Indians. It really didn't happen much here. Um, the great you know, bulk of the really difficult things were happening in Parker County, Palapeno, Wise County, in that area west, all the way up toward Paladura and, Al and uh, Amarillo. But I'll tell you that that little 12-pound house you're sitting on the courthouse lawn, when you bring visitors to town, if you want a little tidbit of information, it was very carefully placed so that it is angled at the front door of the old courthouse in Dallas. <laughs> and we'll talk a little bit more about you know, the, the, the off and on rivalry between Fort Worth and Dallas over the years that as we move toward the next century, we clearly have to get over as we begin to look at regional planning and how we're going to make our individual stories that are so interesting blend into a major regional story so that we can all work together. And as we move this population to what's our expectation within the next 50 years, doubling here nearly 12 million people expected in our Dallas, Fort Worth, Arlington, standard uh, metropolitan area. You know, kind of astonishing to conceive of that many people being here. My first relatives arrived in Fort Worth about 1878 when the population was 5,000. Like the workforce of the city of Fort Worth alone now is a little over 6,000. So we've come a long way since those early days. But as soon as that fort closed in 1853, we had a group of enterprising people who had moved in to be around the security of the fort, set their sights on a critical aspect of frontier life, and that was the county seat. Tarrant County itself was established in 1850, just a year after the fort, named for a former uh, officer in the Republic of Texas Army who had helped kind of clear this area of the Native American presence to open it up for settlement. So General Edward Tarrant is the, the namesake of the county. The original county seat was a little town just northeast of us called Birdville. And to give you an idea of what happens when you don't stay the county seat, Birdville only exists today in the name of the school district there in Baltimore City. But in 1856, there was enough of a push politically in Austin from the citizens in Fort Worth to call for a new election. On the eve of the election, in August of 1856, a group of very enterprising Fort Worthians went up to Birdville and they siphoned the whiskey out of the inducement barrel. You remember your American history, only white property owners at that point could vote, and it very often took a fair amount of inducement to get them to come into the polling place. So we stole the whiskey, and then for good measure, we imported in about a dozen voters from Parker County. 
We won the election by seven to nine votes, depending on the count. Uh, Birdville was, needless to say, very unhappy about it. There were several killings over it. But by the time Birdville was able to convince the legislature that the election had been fraudulent, uh, Fort Worth, after four years of being the county seat, won the election in 1860 fair and square. At that point, we began to build our first permanent courthouse on the site where the present courthouse is today. And we were ready, I think, to take our place on the frontier, but then for the coming of the Civil War. During the four and a half years of Civil War, that frontier that had been securely pushed 100 miles west, as all of the military resources that were focused on protecting the frontier in Texas turned eastward, and the Texas troops were sent out into the Trans-Mississippi and as far away as Virginia and Gettysburg during the Civil War, the Comanche and the Kiowa pushed their frontier all the way back into the borders of Terry County. And it made Fort Worth once again a very dangerous and precarious place to be. By the end of the Civil War, there's one great recollection by one of the Confederate veterans who arrived here immediately after the war, that there were probably less than 150 people living here. Most of the buildings in town were empty. The courthouse sat unfinished from its 1860 start. But Major Van Zandt, along with several others, decided to set their stock in Fort Worth. And they saw a future here in this little community on the bluff. But at the end of the war is what kind of set Fort Worth on its almost permanent identity. You know, our nickname is Cowtown. We come by it very legitimately. At the end of the Civil War, the beef market had been virtually depleted feeding the federal armies in the north. A cow was selling in Chicago and Kansas City to feed that northern market at nearly $20 to $30 a head. Now, when the Spanish had arrived here back in the 16th century, they brought with them cattle, horses, sheep, swine. Inevitably, those animals, some would get loose from the presidios and the missions. Well, of course, we know what happened to the horses as they got loose. The Comanche, in particular, adopted the horse and within the span of probably less than three or four generations, completely transformed their culture from a walking nomadic culture into probably the finest horse culture, uh, certainly on this continent, and probably as fine as anything that, that was produced out of the Asian steppes, you know, you know, comparing uh, you know, the Comanche here to Genghis Khan and the sway and the enormous territory that they controlled. The cattle, in many ways, ended up going down into that area between the Nueces and the Rio Grande. And over not very many generations, those descendants of the Spanish cattle developed these huge horn spans to help them negotiate the very thick brush down in South Texas. Of course, it's the breed we recognize as the longhorn. At the end of the war, a longhorn, I mean wild animals, loose in South Texas, was worth maybe two to three dollars a head. So it didn't take somebody long to put that two dollar cow together with the twenty dollar market. And that led to the period of the great cattle drives, you know, certainly talked about in, in the great um, John Ford Western Red River, or even later the Larry Mercury story about Lonesome Dove and driving cattle out of Texas. It's estimated by the end of the Civil War there were close to 10 million of those Texas cattle roaming in large measure free throughout South Texas. Uh, although a lot of the great cattlemen didn't hesitate to just take whatever cow they might find, whether it belonged to somebody else or not. Some great fortunes were built on some fairly questionable title uh, of animals. But of those 10 million cattle, we estimate that 4 million of those were driven through the streets of Fort Worth, because we found ourselves smack in the middle of that great northern trail that came up from South Texas through San Antonio, up through Waco. The cattle trail came into downtown, into Fort Worth, down through the Sycamore Creek watershed, and basically along the Commerce, Main Street, um, Jones Street spine. It'd come through the middle of town. A herd would have anywhere between 12 to 1,500 animals, a dozen or 15 cowboys. But everything obviously would stop. The noise, the manure, everything that went along with this kind of enormous movement of animals coming through the city. The herds could be driven out into the great bend in the river drive out Samuels Avenue and you cross the river there at that bend where the three railroad bridges are. They could bed the cattle down there and the cowboys would come back into town. And what saved Fort Worth's economy, what really gave us our first genuine economy, was based on these cattle herds coming through. But the key factor in Fort Worth was its leaning toward entertainments. And the goal was to keep as much of a cowboy's money in Fort Worth 
before he left and certainly on his way back as those herds were sold up at the trailhead in Kansas. So out of that developed what was one of the great red light districts in the history of the West. You know, our Hells Half Acre that basically began here at 9th Street, went all the way down to Lancaster and from Jones across to Houston. Now there were you know, other legitimate things tracked in there, but our red light district was the centerpiece. If you've seen the movie Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid, even as late as 1901 when they were here, um, that bicycle scene is loosely set on their time in, in Fort Worth. But as soon as that first herd came through here in 1866, Fort Worth leaders said, why are we passing cattle through to somebody else's railhead? We need that to come to Fort Worth. Eventually the railroad would, would arrive here in 1876 after a long national depression that had bankrupted the Southern Transcontinental Railroad that would become known as the Texas and Pacific. When the company went bankrupt in 1873, the railroad had made it just to this side of Dallas, of all horrific places. But up to that point, Fort Worth and Dallas were running pretty neck and neck here on the frontier. Of course, the fort was largely placed here to protect the settlers in Dallas and those moving uh, westward from there. But it was that three-year head start that Dallas had as a rail center that set it apart and, and really gave it that head start. And we quite, haven't quite caught up. But as we look now at this great regional issue of growth, you know, we are now becoming one. But that railroad initially being there by 1873, here in 1876, kind of guaranteed North Texas a major position as we began moving cattle and other goods out of, out of Texas. During that very quiet period in 1873, we had another former Confederate veteran come to town, acquire the local newspaper, the Fort Worth Democrat. And a young Dallas lawyer had come to Fort Worth while people were bailing out of Fort Worth as fast as they had come, expecting the railroad boom that never came. He wrote to the Dallas Herald that things were so quiet in Fort Worth that a panther could sleep unmolested in the middle of Main Street. Well, rather than be insulted by that, you know, that here's this little dusty town over there that's no competition to Dallas, we embraced the panther, nickname of Panther City, and you'll see the panther all over the city. There are two statues to sleeping panthers that were finally erected when we celebrated the city sesquicentennial in 1999, one on the county administration building, and one right around the corner on the, the lawn next to the Flatiron building in Hyde Park. But he also, on the masthead of his newspaper, drew a map that showed nine railroads converging on Fort Worth at a time we had none, at a time we weren't sure we'd have any. It was nicknamed the Tarantula Map. So years later, when a local oil man named Bill Davis brought steam locomotion back with what's now the Grapevine Historic Train, he nicknamed it the Tarantula in honor of Captain Paddock and that vision that we would want at one time become a rail center. Eventually, we had 11 lines converging on Fort Worth. Fort Worth remains the busiest rail intersection in the United States, down here at Tower 55, you know, with issues that I think the city will be facing for many years as these east-west and north-south lines cross each other. So we bring the railroad here in 1876. Our first stockyards are developed right over right where I-30 and I-35 intersect today. They wouldn't move to the north side and create what we know today as the National Historic District until 1883. But as soon as that, we put cattle on that first train out of here, shipping them to somebody else's packing center, the next logical step was bringing that industry to Fort Worth. We tried it in 1890. At a time, Fort Worth was booming. Uh, the great neighborhood of Arlington Heights, 2,000 acres out on the west side, uh, was just getting started with the first private streetcar line that started at 7th and Main Street and went all the way out across 7th Street and all the way out to Merritt and Lake Coma. We had a nation, another national depression uh, hit us here in 1893 that bankrupted the first attempt at a packing facility here, bankrupted Arlington Heights, and slowed progress here for nearly a decade. But we proved without, even with the bankruptcy of that first packing center, that we could do it in Fort Worth. And that eventually led to the investment of a group of Eastern bankers and um, packing families that would bring Swift and Armour, two of the four major pe meat packing concerns in the country, to Fort Worth to establish what we see as the Stockyards National Historic District. When you go out and you go under the great Fort Worth Stockyards sign, that marked the boundary of the company owned town that Swift and Armour controlled the majority interest in the Fort Worth Stockyards. They owned all of the commission companies, all of the livestock pens, all of the banking concessions, 
everything involved in kind of the vertical operation of the livestock industry. Fort Worth would always remain within the top five livestock centers in the country, and you, we were usually number three behind Chicago and Kansas City. Between 1902, when the major plants opened out there, until the 60s when they began to shut down, we processed over 120 million animals through Fort Worth. And the stockyards were the city's biggest employer up until World War II. When the military side of Fort Worth's history came back into play, of course, we'd had the fort here in the brief years, but it was during World War I, and then again in World War II, that we had major military presence here. During World War I, the United States Army was looking around the country for places to train the National Guard troops who would eventually join the fight in Europe during World War I. They took part of that old bankrupt area of Arlington Heights and created the World War I Camp Bowie that spread basically from University Drive all the way out to where Camp Bowie intersects I-30 south to Crestwood and, um, or north to Crestwood and south to just behind Arlington Heights High School. An enormous camp that had infantry operations, cavalry operations, artillery operations, training 100,000 young men from Texas and Oklahoma, members of the 36th Division or the Panther Division, as it was nicknamed to fight in, in World War I. One of the primary um, demands of the Army before they brought 100,000 18 and 19 year old young men to Fort Worth was the closure or the serious restriction of the red light district of our old Hells Half Acre. That was the beginning of the squeeze of the Vice District. We sort of shut it down downtown, but it just got moved out along Jacksboro Highway where it continued in full operation up through the 1950s and out to places like the Top of the Hill Club in Arlington, one of the great gambling houses in the history of, of the area. But attendant with the World War I Army camp were three military airfields that were established in Fort Worth that really gave Fort Worth its first taste and love of aviation that would lead eventually to Fort Worth being named at the end of World War I as the center for the airmail traffic in the Southwest, which galled Dallas to no end. And it played a pretty major role in this long-standing competition between the two cities on who was going to have the dominant airport. Eventually, that would lead to the, to the two cities sitting down and creating you know, our current enormous economic engine of DFW International. But the military would come back to play during World War II when 500 acres were acquired on the south shore of Lake Worth to create bomber plant number three, uh, run, run by Consolidated Vultee or Convair, what's now Lockheed Martin. And in that plant, they produced thousands of airplanes that would fly out here and move over to fight the war in, uh, in Europe and across the Pacific during World War II. So we have this remarkable thread of the military and the aviation side. But while we were going through that work in World War I, another kind of interesting you know, linkage had happened is that when we became the rail center and then the packing center, a lot of the great West Texas ranches established their headquarters or major operations in Fort Worth like the Wagner's 3D range that if you've just read in the news for the is on the market for the first time. One of the largest contiguous acreage ranches in the history of the country, now up for sale for $517 million, I think. We'll see who the taker may be on that one. But Captain Samuel Burke Burnett's Four Sixes Ranch out uh, in, in West Texas headquartered in Guthrie. So that as oil was discovered on those great West Texas ranches, Fort Worth became the logical oil center. By World War I, we had nine working oil refineries in Fort Worth, including one that sat where Blue Bonnet Circle is today. But nearly 600 individual oil companies called Fort Worth headquarters during that period. A lot of them fraudulent. You know, think of that oil boom as what we saw several years ago in the dot-com boom. You know, very similar kind of frenzied activity to invest. A lot of people lost an awful lot of money. But as you look through that thread, you know, we begin with the Fort, with the literally taking the, this, this little frontier outpost and moving it through with a sense of commitment and stewardship by a remarkable group of leaders. And I think what sets Fort Worth aside, and I'll kind of finish this up with you know, your role, having chosen to participate in this, to understand how the city operates and how we move this city forward. Um, you know, as, as the population moves forward, how do we retain an identity that, that is uniquely Fort Worth, 
as a part of this 12 million population. But I think what has set Fort Worth aside is looking back toward those agricultural roots. And I think my final story kind of looks at, at really this difference between Fort Worth and Dallas. Back about, the, about 1880, the two cities were contemplating their futures. And Dallas made a very deliberate look eastward toward a business and a mercantile model, kind of looking toward Chicago and to New York. Fort Worth, at about that same time, made an equally deliberate look west toward livestock and agriculture. And when you look at the fundamental difference between the two cities, it boils down to pragmatic business model or, for lack of a better description, the cowboy way. You know, we have a deal. And I think a lot of it boils down to what we've just come through with the ultimate expiration of the right amendment. You know, the right amendment was put in place to protect this new DFW International Airport that came together when the original deal was Fort Worth would close its commercial aviation at Beecham and Dallas would close its commercial aviation at Love Field. That would have happened but for an upstart little airline called Southwest that said, we like it here and we're not leaving. They won their court case, they got to stay, but in order to prevent Love Field from continuing to compete with DFW in any kind of significant way, Jim Wright established flying restrictions. And you know, I think it's that ability that we still have in Fort Worth to sit at the table and make a deal. You know, practicing law in Tarrant County, I think, is now unusual anywhere in the, in the state. We still can make deals with a handshake based on a word and a bond. And again, an ability to talk through a, an issue and a problem and fix it. And we went through it in the 1950s and 60s through the difficult days of desegregation. We had riots in Mansfield, difficult times in Dallas, and we had a community of leaders here, leaders here of church leaders, business leaders, led by the Leonard Brothers, who convened everybody in town, sat at the table and said, times are changing, we are not going to be dragged into this, we are going to get in front of it, we are going to make a deal, and we're going to, we're going to do this calmly and effectively and successfully and you know, there were certainly issues and hiccups but by and large we, we got through it and moved forward and that is Fort Worth's unique ability and again would tell you that sitting on, a, on city council here where there are genuine discussions you know coming to a decision moving it forward that's just not happening in very many places around the country anymore it is a unique gift here and I think for all of what you will learn as leaders, you know, supplementing and supporting what Ann does, what city staff does, to make sure that we never lose that ability to sit down with each other and, and talk about our future and come to some consensus and move forward. That's your charge. And I think looking back at the history of what got us to where we were, saving us on the frontier, survival through those terrible depressions, we did it through perseverance and a sense of community. So it's wh whether we have the Bassets who spend millions of dollars investing in the city, or just any of us who stop and pick up trash on the street because this is where we live and we're not gonna leave trash on the street. It's our investment. You know, this is where we live, this is our home. And I think preserving our unique story as we grow a part of this giant metropolitan area is gonna be key to our success in that story. So. Thank you for letting me explain a little bit about where we've been. Uh, it'll be fun to see how, this, how you all progress in the program over the course of the year. But thank you very much for what you're doing. Very important to the city.